I think sometimes we can be such a stickler for doing the same thing every single day and we sometimes know that we don't want to do that. It's okay to try something new. Yes, it might not work, mm. but until you try it, you don't know. And I'm so thankful that I was brave and I did make that decision. To be a disabled person, it costs a lot more than a non-disabled person just to actually go about just your daily... Just adapt your life. Yeah, yeah, adapt. Not just like with cars, um, with your clothes, with your house. There's so much things that you have to think about to make yourself live it an easier life. Hello and welcome to Shaping Success, a brand new and very exciting podcast from Simply Be, all about women at the top of their game with me, Fleur East. As a singer and broadcaster, I'm inspired by women who push boundaries, women who have carved a different path to society's stereotypes, women who refuse to fit in. And I want to find out who and what shaped their journey to success. So in this podcast series, I'm joined by female icons from all walks of life to talk about their inspirations, heroes, and the moments that change them. We'll hear from some of the biggest female names and the ones you might know less about as they share their remarkable stories of determination and dedication and reveal the moments and icons that have shaped them along the way. Ultimately, our guests all have one thing in common. They're killing it. So let's meet them. Today, I'm joined by a five-time Paralympic champion, born with achondroplasia, a common form of dwarfism. At the tender age of just 13, Ellie Simmons became the youngest ever individual Paralympic or Olympic gold medalist in 2008. Within a year, she was awarded an MBE at just 14 and became the youngest winner of the BBC Young Sports Personality of the Year. And if that wasn't enough, Ellie went on to dominate the sport of swimming, winning eight Paralympic medals, including five golds, not to mention her numerous world and European titles before retiring after the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games. Now a disability campaigner and documentary presenter, Ellie's ongoing work has had a huge impact on raising awareness of the issues that people with disabilities face. She's a true inspiration to everyone who knows her and has become a very good friend of mine since we appeared on Strictly Come Dancing together last year. So I'm so happy to have her on the podcast. Welcome to Shaping Success, Ellie Simmons. Thank you ever so much, Flair. I'm really looking forward to just chatting away with you. <gasps> I can't wait. <laughs> Honestly, I love that I've got you sitting here because this is all about finding out what are the secrets behind really successful women. And I remember when I met you on Strictly, one of the things that I, I don't know, that struck a chord with me was just your spirit as a, as a person. You're always so positive. And I remember watching you dance like every week and there was a point where I couldn't even look at you. I'd just start crying every time you were dancing because oh. I was just like, she's achieved so much. Uh. She's overcome so much, like, you know, and you're always bubbly and you're always smiley. But I guess we want to know now, who is the real Ellie like yeah. behind all the success? How did you get into swimming in the first place? I was the youngest of five. So I had uh, three sisters and one mother all older than me. And I've been very much a, a child growing up that, yeah, just didn't like sitting a down. I was never one to play video games or watch TV or anything. So my mum always gave us the opportunities to, to try different things. And swimming at the time wasn't just a sport that I thought I was going to be good at or do. Mm. It was more for safety. We had a caravan in Wales and um, we were in the water all the time by the sea. And my natural, my parents just thought, yeah, we need to, you need to learn how to swim. My other siblings were learning how to swim too, or I think they were a bit higher than me with the levels. But yeah, I always used to sit on the sidelines and watch them learning or swimming in the pool. And just next time, next turn, it was me really. And it was just, yeah, water safety. But but for swimming, for me, it was just, just learning how to swim, never thinking that was going to be my career. Where I actually learned to swim wasn't just um, a learn to swim. Uh, it was Bolmere Swimming Club, and it also had a competitive side as well. Ah. I'm I'm sure you've probably all figured it out, but I'm very, very competitive. <laughs> Not just in the water, <laughs> but outside as well. And I think that competitive spirit, yeah, definitely helped me achieve what I did in the water. But also, I think when you're young, and especially having dwarfism, and being in a, in a swimming club and a learn to swim with 
people who are, are average height and mm. non-disabled. You try and keep up with them as much as possible. So I always wanted to be with my friends and work harder to, to get those badges. And the coach at Bulmer Swimming Club at the time used to always come to like the learn to swim side and like just bit like talent, not talent spot, but just come and see, oh, who could swim maybe competitively for the swimming club? So he said, oh, come Ellie, come to come to try out the competitive side and come and do a bit of lane swimming and see, see what you think. Oh. And yeah, I just loved it loved it I was um didn't just swim once a week I swam ended up going home and saying like well Ashley said if I wanted to be really really good um I had to drop another activity and do swimming so and swimming ended up being twice a week three times a week and for me swimming was very much not just something I thought yeah I liked but I had a lot of friends from it too. I always mm. used to go to the swimming pool 30 minutes before the session to mess around in the changing rooms. And I was always last to leave as well because I was messing around in the changing rooms with my friends. So it ended up being not just like a sport or swimming. It was more just the friendship that I had around it. And how did you get into it professionally though? from that point? Like, was it quite easy for you to get into it or? So I ended up swimming for my club, swimming on the weekends at their like local Diddy League competitions mm. and representing my swimming club. I never did well, like I always came last. Really? Yeah, because I was yeah. against um, having a disability and a lot of the other athletes at that time, well, they did, they were non-disabled. Mm. It actually wasn't till um, watching Athens 2004 Paralympics, I was sitting on the sofa as an eight, nine year old and I was like, wow, there's people like me mm. on TV. There's people competing at a Paralympics. I never knew that there was disability competitions. I never knew that there was the Paralympics, but that was that turning point. I was like, wow, this is the Paralympics. I, like I said to my mom, how old do you have to be? What do you have to do? And she was like, you have to just work really, really hard. And I think as an eight, nine year old, my, my dream was set. I was like, so in awe of these swimmers and so in awe of what the Paralympics was. I was like, wow, I want to become a Paralympian. I want to get a gold medal. Never thinking that dream was going to happen, but I was just, yeah, my dream was set. And then my mum also then was aware of disability competitions and did some research. And then in the December of 2004, I went to my first disability gala mm -hmm. um, and competed there. And there was um, like talent spotters from British swimming there and uh, they saw me and as soon as I got out the water, they came over and said like, oh, you could be pretty good. Because at the time I never thought I was that good because I was racing against non-disabled yeah, swimmers. Yeah. So I thought, yeah, I was just doing it because I enjoyed it. Where actually they were like, yeah, come on the team. Like we would love to have you on the start program on the talent of British swimming. And it just went on from there really. I think it was that turning point. But I think that's why since now being in the Paralympics and having a disability and talking about it and the power of TV mm. and representation is so important because if I wasn't sitting on that sofa and watching the Paralympics and watching people like me, I would have never achieved what I did. We need to big up Stephen Val. Oh yeah. Your parents, big up. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Uh, Stephen Val. <laughs> <laughs> we recently watched a documentary, which is oh, oh. incredible, Ellie. <laughs> We learned all about your adoption. We met your family in it. And I learned that you grew up with an entire family full of siblings that also had disabilities. So yeah. how did that shape you growing up in that family? I've just had the most amazing childhood. And I think when you're around people that are different, it just really helps you accept differences in society mm. more and to be open about it and to treat people with kindness. And yes, our house was, our parents' house, and even my house now is full of like, adaptions and lots of stools and stuff mm. but it works and I think like credit to them like my parents I wouldn't be the person I am today without them but I was so thankful for the childhood I had and the support that I had from them and especially like giving me those opportunities of trying different things mm. and letting me be active and letting me be yeah not naughty and stuff like that. How have you seen things change from when you were growing up and you were trying to get into swimming how do you think things have changed now 
for children with disabilities that are trying to get into sport? I think the education is out there and I think the acceptance and I think especially in grassroots I was so lucky that my coach at the time Ashley Cox was just treated me exactly like everyone else in the club mm. and didn't disregard me I've heard so many stories of people trying to get into activities trying to get into clubs and just the, the coaches or the, the teachers just saying no because they were just scared, they're fearful mm. of um, of a disability. So I think a lot has changed because of education, the acceptance of, yeah, everyone, yes, you might have to do things in a different way. Like when I was swimming, I didn't, I say um, an athlete or a swimmer was doing 200 metres in the water, mm. so full lengths of a swim, an Olympic size swimming pool. I would do 150 metres, but finish at the same time. He was amazing at adapting and making me be part of the team, including me to be part of the team. Like like I said, I swam for their, them at the swimming clubs. I didn't do well for them. I didn't get points, but I was still picked to go on the coach mm. and picked to be part of the team. And I, I just felt amazing because I was part of the team. I was included. And I think that goes such a long way. But I think talking about it, the education of different disabilities is so powerful. And I think it's great to see how far it's come. And I think the Paralympics and seeing the likes of people on TV that are like you mm. with representation is so, so important. But that Paralympic movement and that Paralympic journey from like Athens 2004 to, to Beijing 2018, London 2012 was the turning point. What Channel 4 did, like as soon as the Olympics were finished, there was advertisement everywhere saying mm. thanks for the warm up. The things like the last leg, that was created from London 2012, but now is, is on TV every Friday night, you know. We were seen as household names we were seen mm. as the same as olympians you know we train exactly the same yes we have to do it in different ways adapt and stuff but we still put our heart and soul into swimming or into our sport the exact same as the olympians so i think there's been a massive change in acceptance and it's great to see that going on a on a trajectory and i would hope it continues yeah let's talk about london 2012 yeah then, <laughs> that's probably one of the moments that most people know you for. I mean, you won four medals, two were gold. Yeah. And like you said, the Paralympics were bigger than ever before. What was that like? What was that experience like? Uh, if I could do London 2012, I would do it any day. I can't believe it. it's 11 years ago I now. Know. And still people in the streets and stuff say like, oh, London 2012. And I think it really brought the country and nation together. I think people wanted to see the Paralympics. There were sold out stadiums. I remember walking out for my first race, the, the 400 metres freestyle, just being, well... Excited, yeah, but so nervous yeah, as well. I've never yeah. felt nerves like it until you do Strictly Come Dancing yeah. and that name gets called <laughs> and you're dancing the cha-cha-cha. The cha-cha-cha. <laughs> Ellie Simmons <laughs> and Nikita Kuzman. But yeah, I think the nerves were just... Uh, something else and I think but also having that 17 and a half thousand people in the stadium in the swimming pool creates a lot of pressure as well mm. and especially when you're going into a games which is your home games there's a lot of pressure on your shoulders yeah. people have expectations on you was just yeah just crazy and I was so so thankful I think when you're under that amount of pressure especially with the nation the NGBs, the Paralympic Committee, all expecting you to get these gold medals. That's when you rely on your support system the most. I was so thankful for my parents, my coach, Billy Pye, who's been part of my my team since 2006 to when I retired. So he knows me in and out. He's like my best friend. And then my psychologist as well. And I had a massive support team, physio. I think because it's funny, isn't it? Like you see as a, when you're a swimmer or you're an athlete or when you do your performance, you're, you're just you on your own. But actually... Mm. There's a whole team around you to get you to that that position, to that. And I can't thank them enough for helping me go into London 12, 2012 at the best possible. I was in the best shape, not just physically, but also mentally as well. They really, really helped because there was days when it's tough, you know, mm. you've got your emotions and especially leading into 2012, not just being a home favourite, but 
my comp- a new competitor came on the scene, an American, and I love beating Americans. You know, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully no one's. Yeah. What is it about beating Americans? <laughs> you know, you like, like they're just so because they're like, so like confident. Yeah, like, yeah we you got know, this. yeah, yeah, and yeah. you just want to like so um, just get them. You know, they're always in the cool room with their sunglasses, listening to big music. You know, got having that aura around them that yeah, like the confidence. I just like yeah, I love beating them. So um, I actually <laughs> so hopefully no one listening here in America. Um, <laughs> but um, an American came on the scene actually in 2012. So I was going into 2012, ranked number one, world record holder, achieved in Beijing. So I was going in as favourite. Wow. But an American came on the scene and broke all the world records and stuff. And I was like, darn it, the worst time to come on the scene, isn't it? I'm about to go and compete at home games with everyone expecting me to get these gold medals. But actually, I think... It was a time when I had a bit of a cry because that's what I do. I'm quite emotional. Mm. I have a, had a bit of a cry. And then what I sat down with my coach, Billy, and I was like, we need to beat this this girl. We need to, so we need to do something. We need to work harder. And I think sometimes when you have those moments where, yeah, it knocks you a bit. Like actually for me, it motivates me more because I'm like, I just... I love beating, I love being competitive. So we sat down, we analysed everything about her, all of her races. <gasps> yeah, I'm very much, I, I have like, when I was an athlete, I had like a hit list. So like I wrote down like my competitors that I wanted oh to gosh, beat. She was like Uma Thurman in Kill Bill. Yeah, no, literally like, oh, I was very You're like. like taking them out. Yeah, oh, right, right. Oh <laughs> yeah I did. So I yeah wrote her down and analysed everything about her and we just worked even harder and was more motivated. And yeah, that time London 2012 final, standing behind the block behind her, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. But you know, sometimes, yeah, you got you. You know, I listen to um, Eminem. You know, um, on this, what's the lyrics? It's like on the surface that she looks calm already, but ready. in mm. inside she's about to drop bombs and she's nervous. Well, that was me. You know, I was like, mm, yeah, I can do it. I can do it. Oh no, can I? Can I not? <laughs> like, that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh god, my nerves. But I'll be fine. I'll be fine. It's just eight minutes of swimming. That's all I've got to do. And yeah, my coach actually. Um, going into the 400 free he's the last person you see like I saw yeah. and then you go in t- with your competitors in a room like this pretty much sitting on seats mm-hmm. um, and you're eight other comp- seven other competitors with you and everyone has their own little tactics he was like keep up with her in the first 200 metres and then overtake her um, and I was like oh that sounds easy doesn't it um, so the race happens I go in I swim and the 200 metres comes and I to go up a gear and that gear doesn't work you know she's still ahead of me oh, wow. and I'm like oh gosh Bill someone who I trust who knows everything about me how I race everything I'm like oh gee Bill it's not working I thought to myself just you know regroup like it's about eight lengths I'll just try and keep on her toes as much as I can I think I was losing until that last 50 metres of the race. I turned and that last 50 metres, I was like, I'm just gonna have to head down and go for it, aren't I? Um, And I did, I just, I think that extra, like, because I wanted it so badly, that extra, something from my heart, that will to win, there was all the crowd, people, my school friends who had never ever seen me swim before, family members Mm. who had never come to watch me swim or come to games because it's normally far away, your competitions were there. And I was like, I just wanna do this, I wanna get that gold medal. Um, and your fire comes out, your love, your... It's hard to describe. I don't know if you've ever had that moment. Mm. Do you know when something inside you, like a bit of your soul... It's the just, hunger. You're yeah, just the like, hunger. Nope. And it's almost like the thought of getting the result you don't want. Yeah. So it's like you sort of like picture... I don't know if you you, you pictured this, but yeah. picturing losing and then you're like, nope. Yeah, literally. That whole <laughs> imagination. That. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that picturesque thing of like, say, playing out a race or playing out a scenario. Yeah, no, definitely that that definitely felt and I thought just head down and go for it and that extra desire love and something came out and I touched and I saw it was a personal best and five second PB and a world record and I got the gold it was just yeah I mean. oh I was just delighted but I think that feeling compared to like the previous games in Beijing where I came away with two golds which was just amazing I think when I touched it was different feeling it was like relief that mm. I'd done it because of all that pressure from the nation and 
being the home favourite and everything. It was just finally I got the gold around my neck and I could just, yeah, celebrate. And I did. And the crowd was not really, really good and buzzing and the, the national anthem. And then I had to do a drug test in and I. So, yeah, we in front of a person. So, but that has to go, you know. <laughs> you got to go that. You got to play that with your sport. All this excitement and then you're about to back to reality with a drugs tester. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, this is what I've always been so fascinated about with athletes because there's so much you got to do. Like, talk to me, like, when you were training, what was your, like, standard week like when you were, like, in training mode? I used to get up about 4.45, swim, normally get to the pool half an hour early, do foam roller in, do prep, then you swim for two hours, and then you get out the pool, go to the gym. You would have like, say, physio or meeting with your psychologist mm -hmm. or meeting with S&C. What's S&C? Yeah. So uh, strength down. and conditioning. Strength and conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm really not yeah. That, and then you would go back to the pool for another couple of hours and then either do yoga in the evenings. I was quite into yoga. Wow. Um, so I used to swim like nine times a week. So my Sunday was off, my day off. But yeah, very much regimented, re very much yeah no way you had to be every single day I loved it when we could train abroad that was my love yeah. like because we used to train abroad a lot and then we would go on a world series so we would have to compete at different countries abroad and yeah so we normally probably like looking back I have so much more holidays now since I've retired we'd probably get like three three weeks holiday out of a year, a year? We, yeah oh. so but yeah very much just focused you know very much regimented every single day we had to be somewhere but it was you you sacrifice there's a lot of sacrifice yeah you just live and breathe being an athlete and it's it's amazing and especially when you have success and you have the personal best you have the gold medals but there's times when it is tough, you know, you're physically, you're sitting on the sofa and your your body is mm. just throbbing. It's exhausted. Um, and then you're mentally exhausted too. But so, by the time Sunday come, I'll be like, oh, that's so nice. I get a day off. But then you got to get back to it on Monday. What moments have happened that maybe people don't know about in your life? Like positive, think of one positive moment one. that's happened in your life that maybe we don't know about that has helped make you who you are and helped you achieve what you have? I think for me, I had a year out after Rio. I made um, a big decision um, just to take a gap year from my sport. So I'd been to, to Beijing, London and Rio. And I think sometimes people are a bit fearful of taking a bit of a, a leap or a bit of a career break. And I did after, after Rio. And I went traveling for the year. Um, and it was probably the best year of my life. I think I found more about myself than I probably ever do have done because I was so known as Ellie Simmons, the swimmer. I'd missed in a way, I think achieving from age 13 to 17, I missed a lot of my like growing up stage, mm. you know, when at 17, 18, you're normally going out drinking, you know, having a time, you know, figuring yourself out mm. with that type of life. I wasn't able to have that because I was competing in London 2012 during that time. So I had to be really, really focused. Like I missed my prom, I did my GCSEs and A-levels uh, in different countries, yeah. you know, so I'd missed a lot of that growing up stage. Um, so after Rio, I decided to, yeah, to take that year out and I thought, where shall I go? So I went to so many different places and majority, again, being an athlete and being a swimmer, you you make friends with a lot of people abroad. So mm. I was bumping, bunking at their houses and stuff. But it was so nice to like find out who I was, like my confidence, being able to travel abroad. I never travelled on my own before. I went, remember, getting a flight to San Francisco and having a couple of weeks in San Francisco and the whole of California on my own and then went to Mexico from there and stuff. And I would never have done anything like that if I didn't make that decision to take mm. that year up. And I think the confidence that being on your own gives you, I think it's scary, isn't it? Like, yeah. But actually it helps so much. And I made so many amazing people. I spoken to people that I would never have done before. It would just, yeah, it really, really helped me just figure things out. And then I decided to get back in the water. But I think having a bit of a career break, having a bit of a change, having that leap of faith to do something totally different. Because remember everyone on British Women was like, why are you doing this? Like mm -hmm. you're on the height of your career, you know, just come back from Rio. I did a PB, a world record and a gold medal. And I got Tokyo four years later. People 
were like, you shouldn't like keep going, keep going. But actually I was like, took control and I did it. And yeah, it was the, the best year ever. And I think that's what I'm trying to say. I think sometimes we can be such a stickler for doing the same thing every single day. And we sometimes know that we don't want to do that. It's okay to try something new. Yes, it might not work, mm. but until you try it, you don't know. And I'm so thankful that I was brave and I did make that decision. Why did you make the decision? What made you want to take a year out? I needed a mental break. I needed to, yeah, figure things out, find out who I was away from the water, have a bit of a rebellious stage, you know, drink mm. and stuff and meet lots of people and things like that. And it just, more mentally it was than, than anything else. You've achieved so much and like we we've spoken about, you're such a positive person. But I'm curious to know, outside of all the sacrifices you had to make, what other challenges did you face? Because it, it can't have been easy to like break into the industry and become this <laughs> Paralympic gold medalist. Like that didn't just happen. Right? No, no, I think um, the two factors, I think age. Um, and again, I've achieved when I was so young, but actually before that, um, people were fearful of be me being so young. I missed a few selection things just because they said I was too young. Mm. Um, and yeah, I look back and I know why, because again, when you're 12, you are still a kid. But at that time, it, I was hitting the same time, at, time as the, the adults on the team. I was doing everything the same as them, but I just didn't get picked. And I think that really, really knocked my confidence. Um, so looking back, age was definitely a challenge when I was at my young age. And also having um, a disability, mm. having dwarfism, you know, there was, and especially now since retiring, there's definitely like people going into this new industry. There's still a few different factors that can affect, you know. And yeah, disability is definitely one. And as I mentioned it when I was in my swimming club, you have to work harder to keep up, you know, you, there's a, I have to adapt things all the time. I have to make sure I can reach stuff, have to try and like change things. I don't, I just do it naturally because that's all I know. Like, I don't know what it is like to live in an average height world. Mm. Um, but there's just ways I have to do it in a different way. And, and I think sometimes it is tough, you know, I have to, I can't walk as fast as everyone else when yeah. I try and keep up. I have to do things in a different way. I have to have stalls all around my house. I have to have pedal extensions so I can't just drive a, a, anyone else's car. I have to only drive mine. But, you know, I don't know anything else, so exactly. I can't compare. But it's just doing it in, in, in a different way. I remember once we went swimming on tour. Oh yeah, do you remember? <laughs> oh, so you were all so good. We were like, Ellie, can you show us yeah. how to swim? Oh, I gave you all tips and you were all actually really, and Tyler was like, oh, I can't swim, I can't swim. But actually his stroke was really, really good. And it that was, was so, so nice. Funny. I think, you know, that tour, I think it really bonded us. Yeah. All, like we were like family by the end of it, you know, because we were, it was exhausting, wasn't it? But actually like, yeah. <laughs> the, it, it was probably one of the most amazing six weeks. Like we just all connected so, so much and all did different things, mm. but just stayed together. And yeah, it was the most amazing time. And I was like, can we not just do another tour? I know. No, Flair, I remember please. when it was coming to the end of it and oh. we were like, this do bubble's you, gonna burst. Do you remember we all cried as well? Yes. Like there was so much emotions. Because you were the one that started setting me off. Oh, it I was know. Like, I think the last day of the show and you were in the change room like, <laughs> I know. It's nearly oh. ending. And I was like, Ellie, I'm not even going to look I at know. you. I know. We always had loads of hyper moments, didn't we, afterwards? We you know, those like little dances There's that so we used to do. so many memories <laughs> yes. from that experience. Oh. And I remember actually that day that you taught us how to swim correctly, <laughs> we were in the changing room. And we started talking about fashion. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was saying, like, because my husband, Marcel, is a fashion designer. Yeah. So I was talking about, like, maybe getting something custom made for you and stuff. And you were explaining, like, your journey with fashion. Oh, yeah. And what it's like, like, looking for clothes and things like that. And, of course, over the years, there's been a lot more inclusivity yeah. and a lot more options. How have you found it now? Like, yeah. shopping. What is um, that experience like for you now? That's actually one of the challenges, which you forget because I, you just you just got to go out and find your clothes. Mm. But it's hard, you know. I'm, it's a lot better now because my f shoes, my feet size are a lot smaller than the average height non-disabled person. And so majority of my sizes 
size feet shoes would be like kids shoes with like butterflies or ah. like glitter or like do you know those ones which which are cool looking those back that light now. Up. yeah mm. and like so actually um, when you're a when you're a 16 year old 17 year old and you don't really want to wear shoes like that you want to be like everyone else and things like jeans like these i've just had there i've just had to cut them you know and again alterations i've got an alterations person but looking back like it costs a lot of money yeah. i can't just look at something and be like like, oh, I can wear that right now. I have to then take it to the alterations person for them to alter. Like this, this is a kid's top. Um, it's great now that children's clothes are cool, mm. you know? Mm. But there's a lot of things, yeah, like I have to look at children's stuff. I have to just think about what I'm buying and if it works and if it can get altered. Like, you know, these like cargo pants mm. that have actually like zips or like... Um, that pockets on yeah it, there's just no point in me getting them they look cool but they'll just be like that all that stuff will just be gone because of the length of the trousers um so yeah it, i just have to think about it like it's getting so much more better now and people are thinking about it there's a lot of designers that are designing for people of different disabilities but it's just yeah something that again you just have to think about before you actually go shopping is there anyone that you've seen that you kind of like like within the dwarfism community yeah. that you've looked at for fashion? Because well, obviously there'll be clothes that you'll look at on certain people and you'll be like, well, I'm, I can't buy that. Yeah, there is actually. There's getting more and more on social media, mm. the likes of Lucy Slate. Mm -hmm. She's um, like an activist with, with fashion and she adapts her clothes. The likes of um, Sinead Burke. Mm -hmm. She works with the high-end high fashion designers such as um, Gucci okay. and all those on inclusivity and adaptions in th that type of field. Um, so yeah, it's help getting better and better. And I think when you see this, but also as well, I think when you get older, you find out your style more, don't mm. you? I think that's, I think when you're a teenager, you're trying to figure out things like, you know, through those teenage years, you go yeah. through puberty, you're going out, figuring out like yourself as a human, who do you fit in with? What's your type of style? What do you look like? Mm. So I think as you get older, you, you, you find your style and what works for you most in your your shape. I love like the style at the moment with like bagginess. Yeah, that like fits oversized. Me. Yeah, I yeah. love things like that. Um, Cause like the skinny jeans just don't work for me because with the my legs size and the bowing of the legs, I always like, I always wanted to fit in jeans, but it'd always be like gapy behind my mm. knees and I always hated that. So now having wearing baggy jeans and baggy clothes are in fashion and also loungewear as well as in yes. fashion. I love that because when you're an athlete, I was rocking that every single day. You'd be like, you yeah, know? just get my trackies yeah, on, so hoodie. Literally like smelling of chlorine, hair in wet on a bun like I didn't mind but you know now it's in fashion I'm like I'll go back to being an athlete <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting hearing about like all the challenges that you have to all the things you've got to consider yeah. when you're just shopping that I would never even have thought about like you're saying like you'd see a, you know a pair of trousers and you go ah let me see if I can get that altered yeah or like what what's available in the children's section that doesn't look like I'm five yeah no, you know, exactly. like all these things you gotta think about I never even considered that. Yeah, and also like I think, like I said, I just don't think about it because that's all I know. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. But also the cost as well. It does. I think there is a statistic out there to be a disabled person. It costs a lot more than a non-disabled person just to actually go about just your adapt daily your life. Yeah, yeah, adapt. Not just like with cars, um, with your clothes, with your house. There's so much things that you have to think about to make yourself live it an easier mm. life and um, society's getting better you know such as there's lifts everywhere there's things people are helping people are, are happy to talk about it but there's still it is it is tough sometimes living in an average height world so i'd love for people to come back down to my size yeah. and see what it's like every single day even like last night um we were me and flo were at a party together and being with lots of tall people yeah um my neck hurts by the end of the night yeah. because you have to look up to everyone. You know, things like that, which you just people just don't think about. Yeah, it's funny. It's, that's something that I adapted to when, yeah. I, when I was with you on Strictly because, again, it's something that you only know what you know, what's your experience. But I remember, like, walking around with you and chatting to you a lot of the time. And there would be times that, you know, a few minutes into the conversation, I'd be like, 
oh, actually, Ellie's like breaking her neck right now. Yeah. Let me sit down. Like, yeah. You know, so I'd like come down to your level. Oh, you guys just, are amazing. Just things like that. But you don't, you don't realize that. But this is why it's so important for there to be representation, right? For oh. To be seen. That's how people learn. Yeah, hugely. Um, and you guys are amazing. Like you always walk slow as well because I couldn't walk as fast as you guys. And Flair, like you guys always like kneeled as well and just thought like about me. And I think that goes such a long way into feeling part of you guys and part of everyone and part of the community, like, and part of the team. Like just, just those extra little things that you didn't need to do, but you did do it just fulfilled me and made my heart so much bigger for you guys mm. than anything else and I think yeah when you're part of a team when you're part of things like that and just I think the awareness and just thinking about someone thinking about oh what makes their life a bit easier just goes such a long way and it does not take up that much of your time no it really doesn't yeah. it makes all the difference you mentioned earlier that there's so many people like behind you yeah like when you see someone achieve something they kind of take all the glory, but then there's a whole village. Yeah. So is there a person that you can think of that in your circle that you grew up with that has really impacted your life? Oh. Somebody who's been a huge influence on you. My dad was a huge is is a huge supporter. Big up Steve. Yeah, big up Steve, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um we're very similar personality wise, which is amazing, but sometimes we're both Scorpions, we sometimes clash, you know, mm -hmm. but I can't like every single day I message him every single day, like he's there for me. He sacrifices a lot of things. He works really hard, but still has time for me. He's helped me to be the person that I am. He's always at the end of the phone for mm -hmm. me. Like, you know, even the silly things. Like yesterday, I wanted to buy a new lamp. I was like, how can I, <laughs> like, I messaged him. Like, he's always got the answers. It's like that, he's that, that dad that's got everything. Like, he just, I go to him for everything. But also I think being in, when you're an athlete as mm -hmm. well. Um, and I think that's one of the factors in a way that was different about Tokyo. It was a COVID games. Yes. And not having, I realized during those games how much a, part they played in my not just career but being a swimmer and my life because normally they go to every competition they go to not just oh, the big competitions world championships europeans they also go to like the little local ones that i used to race at too <laughs> um, they were always in the crowd but during the tokyo they weren't there in the crowd and i realized how much of a comfort blanket they were and it was so hard for them not to i miss them so much being yeah. all the way in the other different country, the time difference as well. There was just walking out and not having them there was a massive, massive, massive factor. But my my dad definitely is just doesn't just help me be the swimmer or be the athlete. But on a day to day basis, I couldn't go without him really. Mm. And who who were the icons in your life? Like outside of people you know personally, did you have an icon, someone that you really looked up to? Um, or you look up to now? There was, so there was a lady called Nairi Lewis, mm -hmm. who's a Paralympic gold medalist. And she was the one actually that inspired me. My dream started because I watched her. I sat on that sofa in Athens in 2004 at home, watched her get the gold medal in the 100 meters backstroke at the Paralympics. As a youngster, I was like in awe of her. I was like, she's my dream, you know, she's like the, the Michael Phelps of the Paris mm -hmm. swimming world. She's like the... Um, Michael Johnson of the athlete world, the Usain Bolts, like I was just in awe of her and I wanted to be like her. Again, we're in the same swimming classification. So in the Paralympics, there's all different classifications okay. with all different disabilities. So there's S1, which is the least severe. And um, S1 is the most severe disability. S10 is the least severe. Mm -hmm. I was an S6. At the time I didn't realize I was an S6. So I didn't realize that there was disability competitions, but mm -hmm. she was an S6 swimmer. Um, and actually that's the December that I um, went to my first disability competition. She was the one that was presenting the medals because oh. they just got back from Athens. I remember I was so like in awe of her, so starstruck, like, oh my gosh, mom, Nairi Lewis is pre presenting my medals. Like I was just like, when you've watched your idol just yeah. compete at a, a Paralympics and then she's presenting you with your medal. I was just like, wow, in awe of her. And now we're like best friends because we've been on the team for many, many years. Oh. And she was like, she was on my hit list to beat. She was, I oh, did. Oh, wow. Yeah, I did. Trip from the hit list yeah. to your friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it's funny, like, it, when you're competing, 
when you're in the call room and then when you're racing, you're like, you're all enemies, all rivals. And then as soon as the competition finishes, you're like best all, all close, all friends together. Like it but all just ends. Yeah, the it's so goes. funny. Wow. Like you're all so focused and just like, yeah, you're rivals, you know. And then as soon as it ends, you're all like, let's get drinks together, let's mingle, let's like travel the world together, all that type of stuff. But when you're competing, um, you're definitely the competitive edge comes in and you've got to be that competitor. Um, but yeah, by the end, she was just, yeah, she's a friend and she's she retired and I got to beat her as well and so so that was always nice you know when you beat your mm. your heroes but she's still my hero I love today that. you know that's always nice when you beat your heroes <laughs> can't relate <laughs> can't relate Ellie sorry <laughs> Claire <laughs> well, you don't get to do that <laughs> that's pretty special to be honest uh, <laughs> we've spoken a lot about we've mentioned it a lot but Strictly yeah. let's get into Strictly oh yeah because... everyone, I don't know about you Flair but <laughs> Oh, everyone loves to talk about Strictly, don't they? Everyone it's like the conversation that everyone wants to talk about, which it's is like fine because it's like, the, dun, 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 yeah, dun, dun, you're like shivers. Oh, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> oh. Why did you want to do Strictly? Why was it important for you to do it? Um, you know, from a fan girl. I've always loved Strictly. I've always watched it. Mm -hmm. I've always one of those that sat on a Saturday night and a Sunday night watching, um, never thinking I'd get asked to do it. So when um, Steph and Sarah came and asked and we had the meeting. I was like, oh yeah, I would love to, you know? You know, I'd love to try out. And I think it was something where I just recently retired from the sports, I, uh, being a swimmer. And I thought, you know, this is something way out my comfort yeah. zone. It's a show that I've loved for years and years. I've loved dancing, you know, like I've never really danced apart from, can you say like when we go out on a Saturday night, it's funny, isn't yeah. it? Like on tour, we would um, dance for like two shows and then we would go back out dancing and dance again. And again like, hours. what are we like if you think about it? How <laughs> so crazy true. are we? Um, but um, no, on a Saturday night, I'm going out with your friends. I love to dance, but never learned like Latin and ballroom. And you know, things like the fake tan, like I'm so used to just being smelling of chlorine all the time with wet hair and like not caring <laughs> a world what I look like we're actually like now I was like getting my hair and makeup done you yeah. know wearing all the amazing outfits by Vicky and the team you know and I thought like let's not say what why say no let's try yeah. it out you know let's say yes like it was a lot tougher than I thought it was gonna be I think less of the the, the physical more of the mental I think you get so wrapped up in it don't you and the pressure to to be in it every week and you realize a show's watched by millions and millions of people. There's such a fan zone to mm. it that you get so wrapped up in all that type of stuff. So it was tougher, but like I wouldn't have met the likes of you, Richie, mm. Mal, Ty, um, Nikita, all those, like Diane, Nancy, like we, mm. you get so close to everyone and it was such an amazing opportunity. And yeah, it was nice when it was done though. You know, yeah. <laughs> Cause I could like, <laughs> My feet are not got yeah, blisters, we don't have blisters and we're not losing yeah, toenails. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, you lost a toenail. Mm, I lost didn't two. You lost, you lost two, two really. didn't I remembered. I remember <laughs> like I thought I had it bad with just a few blisters, but you lost two toenails, you I know? know. <laughs> The, the, we what, you, it, what we? you went through it and it's nice for your hair to recover a bit now as well like having to yeah, all those all the products glam. but I do miss it I'm not gonna lie like it was so nice to like have fake tan on and have your hair and makeup, and, makeup and look really nice now, the clothes and, yeah like now I just you've got to wake up and do your own thing don't you yeah. and like you look like back to what you look like you know where come on guys <laughs> where am where are you make me look a bit better you're gonna continue to be fearless because you're not really afraid of anything Ellie. heights i'm afraid uh, of you that's know. why i keep you on the ground yeah but <laughs> but mentally though yeah you're very strong do you think you have to have that mindset to become an athlete or do you think being an athlete creates the mindset i think it's got to be insight in you nature is definitely i think there's some amazing talented people but if you haven't got that fire that competitiveness that desire that sacrifice that love like then you can get far, but I think what makes a true Olympian and Paralympian is all of that, but in, inside, and definitely you can train it, but to nurture it in the best way. But I think nature is definitely, I've always been positive. I've always been very competitive. I've always been very driven. Like when I want to do something, I want to do it at the best of my ability. Yes, and long may it continue. Yeah. <laughs> How can we stalk you on social media? Oh, well, um, 
<laughs> well, follow me Instagram. <laughs> Ellie Simmons. I think. Okay. I think. Yeah, I think it's just Ellie Simmons. My name. Yes, we'll find you, Ellie Simmons. I mean, of course, I'm already following you, but yeah, we follow each other. <laughs> we'll be following all the greatness that is yet to come. Thank you for sharing your inspirational story. Thanks for talking to me. It's been oh, joy. No, I loved it. I could chat to you all day, Fleur. Thanks. But yeah, thank you ever so much to everyone listening in. Thanks for listening to Shaping Success, a Simply Be podcast. If you like what you've heard, please give us a follow and a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Shaping Success is a Folding Pocket production.